Okay, thank you, Holly and Jed. That is a, a nice segue into um, my section. I'm gonna speak a little bit more about making uh, Gorham silver. And in talking about that, one of the things that I wanna share with you are ways that we try to bring in the making of silver, physically making it, as well as the makers themselves, and take a close look at different processes and techniques that were traditional, as well as those that were innovative for Gorham. And we start here with drawings. As I said, we have over 2,600 um, Gorham design drawings. And these are an excellent tool to think about how does an idea from a designer's head ultimately manifest itself into a piece of silver. And it's a fascinating study of the design process itself. And as an example, I show you this pair of 1871 fruit stands that are in the Ferber service. And uh, while we were at the John Hay Library working with Holly, we came across this. This is the only known extant drawing of one of those 816 pieces that makes up the Ferber service. And it is a beautiful drawing, and it is on view upstairs. And these sorts of drawings give us an idea of once that designer had an idea and they created on paper somehow in two dimensions, how does then that design, who may or may not be physically made by the person who created the design or even drew the design, how does that turn into a piece of silver? And I think when you look at this piece, you can see some of the differences between the drawing and the actual piece. Um, you have this beautiful figure that's perched on this vine, and it doesn't look like in the drawing that she really has much to sit on, but she is sitting upright. Now when you look at the silver piece, and you can imagine discussions between the designer and possibly the person who was making this saying, I need more of a surface to seat this figure on. And that vine becomes this silver volute and she has more of a space to sit on, um, but she still is very precariously purchased, uh, perched. And in the drawing, you see that there's this veil that she was holding on to. Now, whether that was ultimately manifested in silver or not, uh, we don't know. Um, if it was, it is not with the piece anymore. And here you see this little fox. These are pieces um, related to Aesop's fables, so you have the fox and grape. And in the first design, you have only one fox, and he's silver. And then in the final design, you have two foxes, and they are gilded. And I think this is just a, a great comparison between what's drawn on paper and how do you change those different colors, which can be done in a number of um, colors, of course, on paper, how do you change that into metal? And how do you take those white and black pencil strokes and turn them into this bristling fur that's on this gilded fox? And even looking at the leaves, you look at the texture that was so carefully applied to create the background of the leaves, and then you notice the veins have been polished to be shiny and smooth to contrast. We also have quite a few Marderlay drawings, and these are fascinating because they range from such things as this that almost look like sketches. You know, you can imagine a designer kind of just sitting down and sketching this out very rapidly and just getting down the basic form and maybe an idea of the decoration. And then you come to a piece like this, a drawing like this. It's a little more finished. It has much more detail. It has shading. You get a sense of volume. And then you can also see off to the sides and even on top of it, all sorts of revisions. Maybe it's the original designer himself looking at it and saying, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to change that a little bit. Or maybe it's more than one designer standing around looking at this saying, this would work a little better. Or maybe it's a change from a technical matter. And then you begin to see things layered on top of these drawings that just bring the design process along. You get the letter code that's associated with this particular piece. You get things like, Mr. Jordan, this set does not have a tray. Um, you might get part numbers. You might get gauges of silver. Um, most likely, it will say how many pints this vessel is supposed to hold. 
And then you might move from something like this to a full-scale presentation drawing. This is a very large drawing that's on view upstairs, very dramatically painted in watercolor and gouache. And then you might move on to things like this. These were pieces or drawings that were made for the actual production of the piece. These are a precise outline of this creamer and sugar. You can see the letter um, patterns on there. There are computations, again, um, gauges of silver that are supposed to be used and how much the vessels are supposed to hold. And then finally, you get the realized piece. There are drawings such as this that I find to be highly conceptual. When you look at the way that handle comes down to attach to the vessel, I don't think it's possible to really do that. I'm sure there are silversmiths that can, um, but it wouldn't be functional. You couldn't pick up this vessel by that handle most likely. In the exhibition, we have a piece that is very similar to this. This is on loan from the High Museum. This is a Martelet, um wine jug uh, shown at the 1900 World's Fair. And you can see how that conceptual design the spirit of it is still in that piece once it's made. Um, and Martelet is a good example of someone designing it and someone else making it. And how are those um, differences reconciled between more than one person? And this is a beautiful polychrome uh, drawing that is in the Hay collection. And you can just, it looks like you could almost reach out and pick that vessel up. It's so clearly delineated and has quite a bit of volume. Um, you know that they are columbines because it says wild columbine on it. But again, you see touches on the drawing that are very tenuous. And you can see in the original piece, which is in the exhibition, that some of those finer elements have been taken away. Maybe they didn't make sense, maybe they weren't possible, um, but of course at the end you still get this beautiful three-handled loving cup that was also shown at the 1900 World's Fair. Now jumping ahead to the 1920s, this is the cubic service. This is a one-of-a-kind service owned by the RISD Museum and it was made in 1927 by the man you see here, Eric Magnussen. He was hired in 1925 and was with the company until 1929 and he was brought in to infuse a sense of modernism into the company's production, which he did. One of the greatest moments of this exhibition was finding this. This is the original design drawing for the cubic service. This came on my TV screen about a year ago, and uh, it took me a long time to recover, but the next day I contacted them, and uh, they kindly put me in touch with the owner, who you see there. And the owner, her name is Vicki Stenstream, and she is uh, here in Providence with us for this, um, the events of the opening. And Eric Magnuson was her grandmother's first husband, and this drawing was in her possession. And I contacted her, and she kindly loaned us the uh, drawing for the exhibition and the publication. And then she kindly let us acquire it from her. So it has come home to Providence and is reunited with its uh, tea service. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very exciting moment. <laughs> And Eric Magnussen was the only silversmith hired by Gorham who was allowed to put his own maker's mark on the piece. And you see it on the bottom of the coffee pot here, and you see that same mark on the drawing itself. So the designer here, in this case, conceived the design, drew the design, and then physically made the piece itself. Um, if there was any doubt as to what this was, it came in this envelope. Um, it was folded up in this envelope. We were able to conserve it and smooth it down. Um, but being in this envelope probably since the 1920s has kept it in pristine condition. And the story gets better. There's another layer. Um, Vicky's grandmother, Thora Magnuson Buckley, ended up staying in Providence and came to work at the RISD Museum from 1952 to 1970. She was a conservator in the Decorative Arts Department, of course. So a really wonderful Rhode Island story, and you see her there conserving things. Um, now, having the drawing 
in and of itself is, is a wonderful thing to have happen, but it came at a very important time. Um, and Emily's going to share with you some of the conservation that we've been doing. Um, but one of the things that it allowed us to do was when we went to conserve this piece, which used to look like this, um, we had a wonderful guide. Um, over time, the dark patinated tones had turned very light, and I think you can see the difference here. Um, and we wanted to conserve it, it had been lacquered, um, but we didn't know exactly how far to take it. Um, we did have a black and white drawing, a photograph rather, and could see that the contrast was very strong. Of course, this is the Art Deco era, so you would have very dynamic contrast and geometrics. Um, but clearly having the drawing gave us this wonderful guide as to how to bring this piece back to what it was intended. Of course, conservation, everything that was done on the areas that were patinated is, of course, reversible, but very pleased with the outcome. And then um, in researching, I took some time to talk with some local silversmiths, um, both of whom had worked uh, at Gorham, Burr Sebring, and Jeff Herman, and I really wanted to find out how these pieces were made. You know, art historians don't always know how these things are made, so we sat down and looked at these pieces together. And I show you a coffee pot and its original design drawing uh, that was in a group dated 1869. I think it's tracing paper that was attached to uh, cardboard with glue, so that's why we get this kind of amber-brown tone. Um, but I sat down with them and just said, you know, beginning to end, how do you make this coffee pot? And we talked about all of the different processes that would have um, been needed to create this vessel, probably over a dozen. And then how many parts are there? I think sometimes we look at a piece of silver and kind of think of it as a whole piece and maybe it has a lid. But when you start breaking it down, the number of parts and the number of processes that it takes just to make one teapot um, is quite remarkable. And as I mentioned in my overview, this is something that turned into the workbench and we really got into understanding the processes and looking at tools. Um, casting was a very important part of Gorham's business, as any other silversmithing firm. And this is the ice bowl from the Ferber Service, 1866. And you notice this wonderful caribou head that would have been cast. And there are over 12,000 pounds of extant positive bronze casting patterns. And Emily, while visiting them one day, happened to reach into a drawer and she found this, our caribou head. Now, you might think that was an easy feat, but it's not. There are hundreds and hundreds of drawers, somewhere between the six and 700 range in terms of the number of drawers. And you can imagine trying to find something in here. The drawers look like this. They are absolutely chock full of casting pattern after casting pattern. These, of course, would have been in a framework and the designers would be able to go to a drawer and get a part, but they weren't where they started off, so we didn't have that sort of guide. Now later, um, the ledger for the casting patterns um, turned up, which was extremely helpful. However, it is arranged by number of part. So if you have the number of the piece, the pattern number, you can't go to these ledgers and find where it is because this is organized by parts. However, we were fortunate enough to find some pieces. So here you see highlighted uh, bas relief and it's got several pieces with those pieces numbers to the side telling you what pieces that casting pattern was used on. And this is one of them. This is that bas relief that is listed in the ledger. And it was used on a number of the uh, Ferber service pieces. Uh, the terrines that you see here, each one of those has that winged figure on it um, in a variety of ways um, applied to it. The Narragansett pattern, this is the one that looks like it's just been plucked out of the ocean. The, here, the casting patterns aren't really decorating the piece. They're more actually forming the handles, and you see the little seashells on trees um, so that they could make a number of these tiny casts at the same time. 
And later on, Emily did find the antlers for the caribou head. It's complete. Um, back to my favorite vase. Uh, we managed to find one of the medallion castings that's on the side. And we also found this fellow, a great lizard. And he actually resides on the other side of the vase, and you can see him crawling up the side. Um, here he was cast in brass for this particular piece. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but these are pieces that were popular during the 1880s, and Katsushika Hokusai's manga was one of the sources. This is Japanese um, woodblock prints. And while we were there, we actually found this fellow. This is on the vase as well. This is a samurai warrior. Um, some of these things would be adapted from design books, and some pieces were just lifted um, wholesale, and this is one of them. And here you see the samurai um, casting pattern. These are, um, and um, we also found, uh, back to our fruit, our fruit dishes, the fox. We found the fox and the grapes. And these are upstairs in the workbench. There are about 14 examples of these. And um, they have a little anvil on them. And in the exhibition, if an object has one of the casting patterns at the workbench, it'll have a little anvil under it. And you can go find that part um, in the, um, in the uh, third uh, case of the uh, workbench. Back to my favorite vase. It just, it offers so much. Um, one of the reasons I fell in love with this was because of its surface. And this is called their curio pattern, and uh, it was not uh, known exactly how this was made, but there were a lot of guesses. Um, what they were trying to imitate was this. This is mokume gane, which is a Japanese technique. It's layering billets of various colored metals and then hammering them out into these designs that sometimes look like wood grain or wood eye. That's what mokume means. This is highly time consuming. So just as Jed was saying, John Gorham wasn't going to sit around and make one spoon per day. This is a manufacturing company. They have to make a profit at the end of the day. They want to imitate this look because it's very popular. This is what their customers want, but they've got to figure out an innovative way of making it in a less time-consuming manner, and they do. Uh, they come up with the curio pattern, and again, Jeff Hearn was extremely helpful, and he did some actual testing of how this could have possibly been made, and it seems quite probable that you would have a sheet of silver um, take kind of filings of copper or brass, that's what was typically used, heat them together so that the, all of the metals would fuse. And then for the vase, which has a very rough texture, it could be rolled or pressed to be kind of smooth but still retains some of that texture. Um, here I show you a pepper in the curio and you see that, that that texture has been smoothed down quite a bit. They also did flatware with it. So if you can imagine those sheets of silver that they were using for flatware, they just created a sheet of curio, if you will, and kind of treated it in the same manner and were able to create flatware patterns. You've seen this image quite a bit. You might see it again. Uh, this is their preparatory room where the drop presses that Jed was speaking about are located. You can imagine this would be a fairly deafening place to be, but a very important place in the company. The steel dies were cut or engraved by uh, people who were called die sinkers, and you see a gentleman here carving one of the steel dies. They look like this. They're two parts, front and back, and you would first need to roll your silver to a particular gauge. You can see on the left, he's got really thick pieces and they get thinner and thinner as he runs these through um, the roller. And they would be cut out into these blanks, a basic outline of a spoon, a fork. And then they would be put in the drop press. So you would take your two-part die and you would put one piece above, one piece of below. You'd put your flat, uh, blank on the bottom, and the drop press would come down with a sheer amount of force and physically force that silver, a more malleable metal, into the harder steel die. There's no heat involved at this point. There's, there's annealing that happens, but the silver at this point is not hot when this happens. 
And you see here all of those dies lined up under um, the drop press machines. Those that were in active use uh, would have been ready um, and uh, to be used. Others would be locked in a safe. These were a highly valuable part of the company's inventory. And here you see Antoine Heller, um, one of the leading designers of Gorm's most popular flatware patterns. And this is an object that we have in the collection. This is a sample service of the mythology pattern. Um, it's a sample service. If you notice, we'd have a really hard time eating a meal with this. Um, but it was made to show the 24 different mythological designs that were part of the pattern. What I love about it is it really demonstrates the power of the drop press. The metal in between the fork tines hasn't been cut out yet. The metal on the top of what was a half of a pair of sugar tongs hasn't been trimmed off yet. It also shows the combination and the balance, if you will, of mechanization and handwork. Of course, the mechanization allowed them to increase their production, but all of these things then had to be finished by hand. The metal had to be trimmed, it had to be smooth, it had to be polished, and all sorts of things that were done by hand. Um, this is the Ferber Epern, a massive piece that you will see upstairs. This is two feet tall and three feet wide, and it sits on a plateau, and that plateau takes its inspiration from the Parthenon. Uh, this is a reduced version of the Parthenon frieze that's running around the plateau, and it also is on a pair of candelabra in the Ferber collection. What was their design source? Well, here um, you see its design source. Plaster casts that we know from an 1862 inventory were in Gorham's possessions. John Henning um, in London carved in slate, in reverse, this one to 20 ratio set so that plaster casts could be produced, and he sold them, of course. And when you look at the spacing in the plaster casts as well as the exact size, it's quite clear that this is what they were using to create this design. And here you see a page from one of those photo albums, and you can see one of the um, pieces from um, the Parthenon frieze in it. These were created by roll dies. And this is taken from um, the workbench upstairs. And I want to thank Peter de Cristofaro, who was wonderful and very generous with knowledge and all things Gorham. These are actual Gorham roll dies and a Gorham cup finished using those roll dies. These are three sets of roll dies for all the bands of decoration that you see on this cup. And here, um, we're going to concentrate on this middle one. For the workbench video, Jeremy Radke and Carson Evans, who created the video um, with Peter's help, went to Virginia, where this Gorham die roll machine resides, made by Gorham in 1888. And here, I hope you can see that big roll die on this machine. They actually took the roll dies that you saw down to Virginia. Virginia, and they created a piece that was made by those roll dies. So here you see it working. You can just imagine the dies rolling into one another, positive and negative, producing this piece. And here you get a um, great detail view of that. So we're really thrilled to have that in the exhibition to illustrate how some of these things were made. There's the piece of metal that was produced, and it would be the same technique that was used to make these sorts of decorative bands that could be used for decoration or even to cover up a seam between two halves of a vessel. Here you see the chasing room, very important part of Gorm's uh, work. Uh, they had outstanding chasers. The chasers and the die sinkers would have been um, among the most highly paid and highly skilled individuals at the manufactory. And this is a service um, that is in the exhibition, recent exhibition acquisition of ours, and it just gives you this um, very clear understanding of how talented they were. This probably would have taken over six or 700 hours alone to chase the full service, which has six <coughs> pieces, and you can see how deeply it is chased. And there are a number of other chased pieces. All of these pieces, um, again, would have taken hours and hours of meticulous chasing to achieve. We also tried to take a look at 
who made Gorham Silver. Um, we've shown you a lot of men, uh, but there were women working at Gorham at a particular point as well. This is uh, about the 1890s. They had very specific tasks. Um, one was sewing the lining for the interior of the storage chest and presentation chest, as well as outfitting the little blocks that would have held the silverware. And also, and you see both of those things happening here, and also mounting all those photographs that they were taking into albums, you do notice she's working under the careful watch of a male behind her, just in case. One of the things they did, though, which was a little more advanced um, and an important um, product of Gorham uh, in the 1890s is silver overlay on glass. So this is taking a glass vessel, putting it in a bath with silver suspended in it, turning on a current so that the metal is attracted to the glass vase, taking it out fully colored with silver. And what she's doing is she's painting on a resist varnish that um, would that was in the actual design that you wanted to have left on the silver. You put it back in the bath, you reverse the current, and those areas of silver that are not covered with the varnish, it pulls the silver back off of the glass, and you end up with this. And they also did this on ceramic. These are two examples of Rookwood, and um, they had a relationship with Rookwood and purchased, would purchase their vessels and do the silver overlay on them. Um, both of these pieces are in the exhibition as well. Uh, women also did enamel work. This is an enamel top jewelry box that's in the exhibition. And they also did plique à jour. Uh, this is a technique of enameling where you have a cell and the enamel itself is just suspended within that cell. They didn't do very much of it. We have um, several pieces of it, including this bonbon spoon, uh, which is just absolutely beautiful. And I will leave you with this image before we go to lunch. And we would ask that you please come back at 2 p.m. And we will start um, the festivities for the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>